my other co-organizer. And without much ado, let me pass on the virtual stage to Rob Rich, who is the director of the Center for Inflation Research and also a senior economic and policy advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, who will be today's moderator. Rob? Thanks, Raphael. Um, so first of all, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are. Um, wanted to note that today's topic, the topics of today's sessions are inflation distorts relative prices, theory and evidence, and low pass through from inflation expectations to income growth expectations, why people dislike inflation. I wanted to expand my, extend my special thanks to the organizers, Raphael Shunley from Brandeis University in Zebra, as well as Dominic Smith from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. So a little bit of background for today's uh, webinar. Uh, the webinar is 45 minutes in total length, with two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for a question and answer session um, at the end. Um, attendees do not have the option to switch on their audio video, but are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. And attendees can, uh, can, of course, post their questions during the presentation already and do not have to wait until the end. So please feel free to submit your questions as the presentations are, are going along. I will then select questions to be answered in the QA portion of the webinar after the presentations. The webinar is also live streamed via the Zebra YouTube channel, uh, recorded and made available on the Zebra website, www.zebra.org, and the Zebra YouTube channel after the event. Uh, and as a disclaimer, participation in the Zebra webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation, or favoring endorsement of the views, opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other participating institution, individual, or entity. All views expressed during a CEBRA or CEBRA co-hosted event are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participants, and not those of CEBRA, the co-sponsoring institutions, or any other participating institution. So with all of those introductory remarks um, behind us now, I'm very happy to turn over to our first speaker, Klaus Adam. Klaus will be talking about inflation distorts relative prices, theory, and evidence. Klaus, um, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, certainly. Um, thanks to the Cleveland Fred and also um, to Zebra and uh, to Rob and Raphael. So let me uh, just um, get my screen shared fully. Um, so this is a joint project, um, uh, the title has been mentioned. It's about uh, inflation distorting relative prices and it's joint work uh, with Andre Alexandrov who is at Princeton and uh, my longstanding co-author Henning Weber from Bundesbank. Okay, so what are we doing? Well, uh, inflation has increased strongly and uh, has also proven to be surprisingly persistent over time. And of course, uh, you know, not long after that, uh, there were calls, why should we bring inflation down again? Um, and uh, if we ask our models, um, the ones, the monetary models that we use in academia and central banks, uh, they would say it's good to bring inflation down because too high rates of inflation, but also too low rates, actually distort relative prices, okay? And in fact, in these set of models, price distortions are often the dominant source of welfare costs of inflation, but there is surprisingly little evidence on this, in particular, surprisingly little structural evidence. So what we do, we provide structural evidence, that means uh, evidence consistent with underlying theory, for inflation actually doing what they're supposed to do according to our models. And we find strong and robust support for this mechanism. Uh, our empirical approach uh, is derived from sticky price models. And we actually showed that uh, the two popular variants of these models, time and state dependent pricing models, they call for an identical empirical approach. And this uh, empirical approach turns out to be surprisingly simple. Uh, it involves two steps. Uh, number one, uh, you want to detrend the relative price of an individual product across time, and then compute the residual dispersion from this uh, detrending or this regression. And then in the second step, you compute the residual dispersion, you compute a regression in which you'd use the residual dispersion in the cross-section of products and relate that to a measure of deviation of inflation from its product-specific optimal level. And the theory is then gonna tell us that the regression coefficient in this second regression is gonna identify the effect of inflation on inefficient price dispersion. 
So that's not too difficult. It may sound difficult, but I will explain further uh, down the talk what exactly needs to be done. Uh, let me mention that this uh, structural approach differs from what has been done in existing work, uh, say very well-known papers by Fernando Alvarez or Sheremirov and others. Uh, they look at a measure of a cross-sectional measure of dispersion and then correlate that over time with inflation, which is quite different. Our structural approach actually works with minimal assumptions, and I want to emphasize that. For instance, we need no assumptions whatsoever on the behavior of the cross-sectional dispersion of flexible prices over time. So, for instance, we do not need to assume that dispersion would not move absent movements of inflation. That's not something we need to impose. And uh, we can impose uh, very uh, strong fixed effects. Uh, for instance, product by location specific fixed effects, and we can allow for product by location time trends in relative prices. All this is permitted at the very finely disaggregated product level where a product is a service or object that is sold at a specific location over time, okay? But we do need some assumptions to be able to identify um, things. And particularly, we need to consider a set of products with identical degrees of price stickiness. So they should be reasonably similar along that dimension. And we also need that the sort of shocks that drive idiosyncratic variations in the desired price uh, are driven by the same stochastic process. Uh, these are the two identifying variations that we need. And uh, we think that, uh, you know, we use then UK CPI micro price data underlying the construction of the CPI. And we think that the UK expenditure items, which are roughly comparable to what is called in the US a CPI entry level item, uh, provides such a set of products. They are very similar products. We can plausibly assume price stickiness to be identical. Idiosyncratic shock processes driving the efficient or the desired price being also identical. And we have 1,000, uh, more, slightly more than 1,000 of these expenditure items in our UK data, which spans 20 years of time. And examples of the expenditure items are TV, flat panel TVs with 33 inch, uh, shoes, uh, men's shoes, trainers, for instance. So relatively finely disaggregated expenditure items. So then we can, um, within each item, we can run these regressions I was mentioning before, in particular for every product, which is a location and an object or service sold in the expenditure item, we can run the following regression. We take the log relative price of the product, we regress it on a fixed effect that may capture product specific level of costs, of marginal costs, or product specific markups and the time trend that captures product specific and location specific trends in relative costs. And uh, we can detrend the relative price this way. And um, this uh, actually is giving you the desired relative price decline that the product actually would like to have over time. It ideally would like to implement. And what we're interested in is this residual. The theory tells us we should look at this residual. And this residual, we can compute the variance of this residual for every product in the expenditure item. And then simply regress it on a measure of the deviation of actual uh, inflation from its desired rate of relative price decline. Okay, so this is a measure of the suboptimality of inflation from the viewpoint of the product whose desire it is to let relative prices fall at the rate pi star. In particular, if pi is larger than pi star, then inflation would fall, would cause a faster rate of relative price decline than is desirable from the point of view of the product. Okay, so with this second stage, the coefficient of interest is this CC, and this CC, according to the theory, sticky price theory with time or state dependent frictions identifies the marginal effect of inflation on inefficient price dispersion. That's it. So we run this regression 
and uh, you know depending on what sort of theoretical model you have this regression coefficient would be related to underlying structural parameters of the model for instance in the calvo case it would be related to a measure of price stickiness alpha is the calvo parameter and uh, the higher is alpha the larger is the stickiness of prices and the larger would this coefficient be in the many cost model the coefficient would be related to an inverse measure of the frequency of price adjustment. All right, and what we can now do is we can run this regression at the level of each expenditure item. We have more than 1,000 expenditure items. And then we can look at whether, as predicted by the theory, this coefficient is in fact positive, okay? And that's what we do. So I show you now uh, the cross-sectional distribution of these coefficients. So on the left-hand side is the distribution of the intercept term that's less of interest. And on the right-hand side, we have this coefficient that identifies the marginal effect of inflation on inefficient price dispersion. You can see that the majority, the vast majority of these estimated coefficients turns out to be positive as predicted by the theory. And if we look at T-statistics, uh, you see that they are very large. In fact, 95% of the coefficients have a T-statistic that exceeds uh, positive 2, so it's statistically significant. This result turns out to be very robust uh, across a number of alternative specifications. For instance, you can uh, add in the regression linear terms, it hardly moves uh, anything. And these linear terms would have, as predicted by the theory, close to zero coefficient. We can also include or not include sales prices in this regression. It doesn't make any difference to the results. And in the paper, which is actually available on my website, uh, we have an alternative approach that only looks at within product variation. And that approach also is going to deliver very similar results. On top of that, we can show in the paper that these coefficients do vary with the measures of price stickiness as predicted uh, by the theory, but I have no time to go into this uh, further. What I want to do instead is now look at more aggregate results. We have in the paper an additional result that allows us to decompose the cross-sectional dispersion of prices. In particular, the cross-sectional dispersion of log prices can be decomposed into one component that is a, represents an identifiable component of the flexible price distribution. So that is something that is because flexible prices moves. And then a residual component. And time variation in that residual component, we show, captures time variation again in inefficient price dispersion that is due to time variation in inflation. Okay, This residual dispersion does, in general, not identify the level of inefficient price dispersion, as we show, but it identifies variation over time. Okay. So what we can now do is we can decompose the overall dispersion in prices that we see in these expenditure items. And uh, let's have a look at how it behaved. Here is the variance of log prices. So what is this measure? We compute in every expenditure item the cross-sectional dispersion at any point in time and then aggregate across expenditure items using expenditure weights. And what you see is that the variance increased from a level of around 15% to a level of around 23%. So a 50% increase in the variance of log prices over time, this is huge. What did inflation do over time? Well, inflation didn't move a lot over time. It was at 2% initially, dropped a little bit, went up a little bit, went down a little bit, but certainly inflation over time isn't moving at all with the variance of prices. This holds true even if you detrend the line up there, uh, the overall dispersion of prices. There is no statistically significant correlation. However, uh, what I told you is that we can decompose this cross-sectional dispersion into the identifiable component of flexible prices and this residual component. And that residual component uh, is shown here in the lower graph. Okay, It is the red line. And you see that residual component, which according to the theory captures time variation in inefficient price dispersion, is strongly correlated with inflation. In fact, the inf correlation is about um, 
0.58, so close to 0.6, and is statistically significant at the 1% level. So this shows that in the aggregate, over time, movements in inflation do co-vary positively with inefficient price dispersion identified in a way that is consistent with the underlying structural model. So given this, now if you look at the scale, okay, you see that this variation in inflation is about uh, very small, you know, the, from the bottom to the top, it amounts to about uh, 1.5 to the 10 to the minus three, okay? So how much price dispersion does uh, time variation inflation actually generate? Well, the square root of that. So uh, it amounts over the sample period in uh, the price dispersion generated by variation in inflation alone amounts to around the square root of that. That's around 3.9%, uh, a standard deviation of 3.9%. So that's, I think, not small. It's quite substantial. So overall, however, this sort of inefficient dispersion makes up at most 1% of the observed variance, okay? So then the question is, what drives the large increase in the variance of observed prices, the cross-sectional dispersion of prices over time? Well, the answer is, it is the flex price distribution, okay? So here we see the black line is the measured cross-sectional dispersion, and the other lines are measured of our um, identifiable components of the flexible price distribution, and you see they track each other very well. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. I think we don't have much time left. So monetary models in central banks um, and academia, they do postulate that the welfare costs of inflation are largely due to price distortions generated by inflation. We find strong support for this notion at the product level, where we show that deviations of inflation from the product-specific desired level uh, leads to large increases in inefficient price dispersion. And at the aggregate level, we show that inefficient price dispersion co-varies positively with aggregate inflation over time. In fact, the amount of inefficient price dispersion that is solely due to inflation appears large. Estimates suggest that the standard deviation over the sample period just generated by movements in inflation amounts to at least 3.9%. Upward trend, though, in the overall dispersion in prices is largely due to an upward trend in the dispersion of flexible prices. And um, I think that uh, concludes the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Klaus, uh, very much. Um, again, let me encourage our audience to go ahead and submit any comments or questions that they have into the, the Q&A box. And with that, I'm very happy to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Ina Hajini. And Ina will be talking about low pass-through from inflation expectations to income growth expectations, why people dislike inflation. So Ina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Um, many thanks to the organizers for the invite to talk about this paper. So. This is joint work with Ed Notak, John Lear, Matthew Paramonte, Rob, and, and Raphael. And the usual disclaimer that these are our own views applies. So the question that this paper is trying to give an answer to is about the interaction between inflation expectations and income growth expectations and the nature of the causality between the two. This is a relevant question in the current economic environment uh, where we're observing persistently high inflation as well as tight labor markets. So therefore discussions about potential wage price spirals have resurfaced. Moreover, there's a number of different sources of surveys that have found that consumers have this big dislike for inflation and that they generally associate it with worse economic outcomes. However, the mechanisms underlying this dislike for inflation remain largely unknown, and we believe that we need to better understand the role that inflation expectations play in order to get to the core of, um, of why consumers dislike inflation. And in particular, one um, surprisingly overlooked channel has been labor markets. Um, in fact, there is very little evidence on the role that inflation expectations play for labor market decisions. And you know, we were surprised to, to find that there's fewer than a handful of very recent papers that have started uh, to look into this. And of course, once you think about labor markets and inflation, an organic question is whether nominal wage rigidities matter for how households uh, perceive inflation. 
In the present paper, we're going to try to answer all of these questions by relying on a representative sample of the US population to simultaneously measure inflation expectations and income growth expectations. And then we're going to implement a novel experimental setup to assess the causal link between the two. In the final part of the paper, we're going to incorporate our empirical findings into a standard New Keynesian model with nominal wage rigidities and search and matching frictions to assess the macroeconomic implications of what we find empirically and better understand the picture uh, behind why consumers dislike inflation. So on the empirical front, uh, our paper will um, bring to the literature three novel uh, results. We're going to find a causal yet moderate relationship running from inflation expectations to income growth expectations. This pass-through is very incomplete in the order of about 20%. And we're going to interpret that as presence of current nominal wage rigidities feeding into consumers' expectations and how consumers link expected income growth and expected uh, future inflation. This pass-through is highly heterogeneous across different sociodemographic factors. Uh, for instance, we do not find a significant pass-through for women or low-income respondents, but on the other hand, we find a higher than average pass-through for high-income and, and male consumers in the orders of 34 and 27 percent, respectively. And finally, uh, we will observe that inflation expectations have only small causal uh, impacts on labor market actions. We're going to find that inflation expectations will have a positive impact um, on the likelihood that our consumers apply for another job, but we're not going to find any, uh, any causal effect of inflation expectations on consumers' likelihood that they ask their current employer for a raise or that they work longer hours to increase their income. On the model front, we do a number of exercises, but today I'll touch very, very little at the very end on this. But at a high level, relative to a counterfactual unit pass through, what we're going to observe is that when the economy is being shocked with, a, with an inflationary shock on the demand side, consumers will be suffering from lower utility because they're working longer hours at, row, at lower real wages. And on the other hand, if the economy is being shocked by an inflationary supply sided innovation, the a negative link between output and inflation will be amplified in the in the um, aftermath of a lower uh, pass through uh, from inflation expectations to income growth expectations. More generally, we're going to find that presence of higher nominal wage rigidity, which is linked with lower pass through, will yield either a less positive or a mo or a more negative, depending on on the type of the, the inflationary shock association between expected inflation and expected utility, and find. Finally, no macroeconomic effects will be observed um, as a result of the uh, pass-through of inflation expectations into labor market actions. Without further ado, let me get to the core of the paper. So the experimental setup is, has really become the gold standard in the, in the recent macro literature. So in February, in February of last year, we worked with about 7,000 respondents. And initially we asked them about their prior inflation expectations and income growth expectations. This will be the pre-treatment expectations. And then we randomly assigned them into six different groups, a control group and five uh, other information treatment groups. In the third step, we pulled everybody back together to ask them about their posterior expectations as well as labor market actions. So in terms of prior questions, when it comes to inflation expectations, we will be relying on a novel uh, measure that is the indirect consumer inflation expectations now known by the acronym of ICIE. This, have, this has been a joint project between Cleveland Fed and Morning Consult, and we have been uh, publicly making available uh, this measure at the aggregate level on a weekly basis starting from 2021. The question in a nutshell goes as follows. Um, so given that um, given your expectations about developments in prices of goods and services during the, the next year, how would your income have to change to make you equally well off relative to your current situation such that you can buy the same amount of goods and services as you do today? So in a nutshell, the question is trying to take advantage of the theory of indirect utility to infer consumers' inflation expectations. And for some context, um, this figure is plotting the evolution of this measure um, 
since its birth in 2021 up until recently. And as you can see, as inflation starts picking up, so do uh, this one year ahead inflation expectations. And more recently, um, um, it looks like they have cooled off a little bit, but uh, yet they remain um, systematically uh, high above 6%. In terms of the prior income growth uh, expectations, we're going to use what I like to call the plain vanilla question of whether households expect their income to increase, decrease, or stay about the same in the next 12 months. All right, so once we collect their, their responses, we're going to then assign our respondents randomly to six different groups. So you might belong um, uh, to, to a control group that receives no information. You might be assigned to a group that receives information about the inflation long run target. You might be receiving information about the, um, the wage growth expectations according to the conference board. You might be given information about the past annual uh, CPI growth. You might be given information about SPFs, anticipated CPI growth, or you might be given some information that is unrelated to what we're trying to, uh, to do here. And in our case, we chose, um, we chose to give them information about the US population in 2021. The idea of this last treatment is really to be there as a placebo for us to understand whether people are reacting to any piece of information regardless of its relevance. And then in the final, uh, step, right? So we, we're pulling everybody back together and we are re-asking them about their inflation expectations and income growth expectations with slightly different questions as is common standard in the, in the literature so that respondents, they don't feel like they're being tested um, on, on what they anticipate future inflation and income growth will be. So for inflation, we're going to rely on the Michigan Survey of Consumers type of question. And for income growth, we're going to just move the annual forecast horizon forward by, uh, by three quarters. Okay, and finally, we're going to ask our respondents about labor market actions. In particular, we'll try to understand how likely they are to do any of the following in order for them to increase their income over the next uh, three months. So um, for each one of the, the options, being applying for a job that pays more, working longer hours, or asking for a raise, they need to rate them from very unlikely to very likely. And of course, if none of, the, of these options applies to them, they can uh, inform us a little bit more by describing um, the actions that they're willing to take to increase their, their income. Okay. Now, the empirical analysis is uh, pretty extensive um, and eventually due to time constraints, I'll, I'll try to, to focus here on, on what is important. So the first thing that, that we needed to check is whether treatments are affecting expectations. And it turns out that they do. And I'll explain in a minute why that's important. So posterior inflation expectations, they are being moved around by treatments about the target, past inflation, SPFs, expected inflation, as well as treatments about future wage growth. On the other hand, um, income growth expectations, they seem to be quite rigid and they're affected only by information treatments around expected wage growth alone. Now, this finding that treatments can actually move expectations around is important. Why? Because from a method logical point of view, we're going to rely on the exogenous variation in expectations about one variable that's coming due to treatments in order to quantify the effect of that variable on expectations about the other uh, variable. So to give you an example, suppose that, that we want to understand how inflation expectations causally affect income growth expectations, then what we would need to do is essentially regress the posterior income growth expectations on the posterior inflation expectations while controlling for prior income growth expectations and instrumenting inflation expectations by the exogenous variation in it that is solely due to treatments related to inflation. Right? And a similar strategy is followed to check the other direction as well. So doing that, this is maybe the, the main um, the main um, a table in, in, our, in our paper, and I'd like you to focus on columns two and four, 
Okay, so in column two, what we're showing is that the pass through running from inflation expectations to income growth expectations is very incomplete in the order of about 20%. Whereas in column four, looking at the other direction, we do not find a significant uh, pass through going from income growth expectations to inflation expectations. Um, the pass through, Right, the former pass through from expected inflation to expected income growth is higher for men and it is greater for higher income respondents, but it remains insignificant for women and lower income respondents. Getting to labor market actions, um, there the, the, the empirical strategy is, is similar to, to, to what I showed earlier, um, but in a nutshell, we're going to find no causal effect of inflation expectations um, on our respondents' um, likelihood to work longer hours or ask for a raise um, in their current job in order to increase income. But um, we're going to find a small causal effect of inflation expectations on the likelihood that our consumers apply to another job uh, in order to increase their income. And the magnitude is such that a one percentage point increase in inflation expectations will lead to 0.11 percentage points increase in the probability that our consumers apply to another job to increase income. Uh, from the model perspective, um, I'll give a very brief overview and I'll, I'll only have time to talk about one exercise and maybe leave the rest for, for Q&A if there are any. Um, so we're going to work with a general equilibrium model with search and matching frictions in labor markets. Um, eventually, the fact that treatments, which are information public that is publicly available, are affecting inflation expectations means that consumer or our respondents, they are not fully informed about what's going on. So in order to address that, we're going to introduce information stickiness in the um, expectations formation process for inflation. Um, we're going to have nominal wage rigidity in the form that in any period, there will be some probability that workers cannot renegotiate their, their wages. In the case of no renegotiation, nominal wages will only partially adjust to past inflation. And what I'm noting here in red are sort of the two parameters that are, um, or the, the two features that are very important for us because we're going to use them um, in order for uh, the model to match the empirical pass-through from inflation expectations to income growth expectations. And as a matter of fact, a higher pass-through is typically associated with lower um, nominal, nominal wage rigidity. Um, now, as I said in the paper, we do a bunch of exercises. I'll just talk about one here, um, which is um, we're going to try to understand how presence of nominal wage rigidity, which is linked to the pass-through, it affects the association between inflation expectations and expected utility in the model. What we're going to do is simulate the model for many pairs of um, the parameters guiding the wage non-renegotiation probability, as well as wage adjustments to, to past inflation. Um, so the non-renegotiation probability is denoted by, by a gamma. And what we're going to, to essentially find is that um, regardless of where inflationary shocks are coming from, be this from a demand side or a cost pull shock or a supply side, what we're going to see is that a higher uh, nominal wage rigidity, or in other words, a lower degree of the pass-through is going to make the relationship or the consumer's association between their utility and inflation in, anticip in anticipation uh, about the future be either less positive or even turn negative, right? Depending on how high the nominal wage rigidity is or how low the pass-through between inflation and income growth uh, expectations is. So to conclude, uh, in this paper, what we're going to, to do is measure simultaneously consumers' inflation expectations and income growth expectations and establish um, um, the causality link between the two, if it exists, we're going to find a low pass-through going from inflation expectations to income growth expectations that is heterogeneous across socio-demographic factors. We're also going to find that inflation expectations have only small causal impact on labor market actions. From a model or from a macro um, perspective, uh, we're going to find that regardless of where uh, inflationary shocks are originating, um, uh, people will associate them with worse economic outcomes because it directly affects 
uh, their labor market situation, um, such that higher a presence of higher nominal wage rigidity or a lower pass through will lead to a less positive or a more negative relation between expected inflation and expected utility. And on a macro level, the efforts that our consumers will exert to increase wages because of higher inflation expectations will yield no changes in their real wages, consumption, utility, et cetera. So therefore we're going to observe no macroeconomic effects of, of that. And with this, I, I conclude the presentation and I look forward to the Q&A session. Um, thank you, Ina, uh, very much for the presentation. And uh, again, let me encourage the audience to go ahead and submit questions in, into the Q&A and uh, we'll be happy to, to um, have our speakers then respond to them. So I'm gonna start off um, for a question for Klaus. This is from Raphael. Um, Klaus, you assume that there are no aggregate shocks, multi-product firms are a prominent feature. Should we think that there are firm-specific or sector-specific shocks? And how would this matter for your analysis? Right. So um, this is a this is a you know this is a paper that looks at relative prices. So anything that would be sector-specific. Uh, would sort of uh, net out because it would sort of um, appear in the individual price as well as in the average price. Um, of course, um, we have a simplified framework where um, the price is set for an individual product and not for a combination of products. Um, of course, that is a, a thing, especially if you look at um, supermarkets who probably are more in the business of selling baskets of goods than in the business of selling individual goods. But we have a, a, a universe of product that goes well beyond just supermarket goods. Uh, so we have basically the UK consumption basket, including big ticket icons. We actually looked at, um, you know, various, um, uh, you know, more, uh, sorry, high value items and we find no difference uh, for them in terms of their behavior. So we don't think that uh, this is a, a concern for our results, but we could definitely look more into this. Okay, and I'm gonna follow up with another question from Raphael for you, um, Klaus, and that is, um, since you have the entire basket of items, can you say if there is anything systematic in the set of goods that contribute to the dispersion? Yeah, so we looked at, you know, in the second stage regression where we said um, um, the, you know, the variance of the first stage is explained by the gap between uh, the inflation rate at the item level and the inflation rate that according to the product would be optimal because it would replicate the relative price trend it desires to implement. And we say, where is that variation coming from? Uh, is it, um, you know, we could have put on the right hand side just inflation. Okay, that prevailed over the lifetime of the product. And if you do that, um, you're going to find nothing. Okay, you're going to find coefficients that are all um, centered around zero. Okay, you would find if you naively thought that the optimal inflation rate of each and every product is zero for each and every product because that feature no relative time trends, then you would uh, uh, erroneously conclude that inflation has no effect on relative price dispersion. Okay, I think that's a very strong result because uh, the very simplest model where products don't rotate in and out of the market would feature something like that, right? That the, there would be, uh, you know, the optimal inflation rate in those models are typically zero <laughs> because products do not display relative price trends. Uh, and if you ignore that, you would arrive actually at the wrong conclusion. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to ask a question to Ina. Uh, this is a little bit of inside baseball for everyone, but Ina, I thought... If we could, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the robustness um, results that we did, because we, we wanted to look into the question of whether there was something unique about our particular sample period. So would you like to talk a little bit about some of the robustness checks that we did? I know you didn't have time to go through it, but I think it would be of interest to our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, as, as Rob said, one might, might wonder that, you know, this is a one-time experiment. We did it in February 2021 that had um, you know, markets had their own characteristics. So eventually, um, something that kept bothering us last year was that we wanted to have a second wave of, of the same experiment. And that's what we did in September of, of last year. 
um, we asked, um, we engaged with, with about 8,000 respondents who repeated the exact same exercise with eventually uh, some of the treatments being updated. And what was extremely surprising to us is that we found almost the exact same pass-through of, uh, you know, being rounded to, to about 20%, while the rest of the results um, were holding um, just as they did on, on what I what I presented earlier. So that was uh, very comforting uh, to see that the 20% of a pass through from inflation expectations to income growth expectations was not a one-time uh, occurrence. Right. Um, and that, that, that result made us very happy, didn't it? Of course, of course. <laughs> of course it did. So just share that with the group. Um, Klaus, I know that you and Alexi um, had a bit of a, a discussion here um, and so rather than sort of read the whole thing, can you perhaps just give a quick summary of the exchange that you and Alexi had in, in case the, the audience members haven't had a chance to see that? Yeah, so Alexi asked a, a very important question, and uh, that is uh, there are various sources for in price inefficiency in the economy. Uh, they could come from inflation, but they could come from other sources like product-specific markups, say in some locations, uh, consumers are less uh, price sensitive and therefore retailers are able to charge higher markups. And that could be a, a source of cross-sectional dispersion of prices uh, that would be present under flexible prices already. Okay, And the question uh, that Alexi had, it, whether we'd allow for things like that. And, and the answer is yes. So we are not concerned about decomposing uh, the flexible price distribution into what is socially efficient and what is socially inefficient, like one would do by estimating product-specific markups. But we were interested in understanding the additional dispersion that comes on any on top of any existing distortions and flexible price distribution that is due to inflation. And uh, the good thing here is that uh, this additional distortion is actually orthogonal to anything that's going on in the flexible price uh, uh, distortion. So we have two sorts of distortion that come on the top of each other, and we don't have to speak actually to anything that's going on in the flexible price um, dispersion. And then the second question he had is what sort of assumptions we impose? Um, we sort of impose no assumption on the cross-sectional dispersion of prices and their evolution of time under flexible prices. So the flexible price dispersion can evolve as it wants, basically over time. But we do impose a little bit of structure on uh, the individual prices over time. In particular, we assume they are driven by a product location-specific intercept, a product location-specific time trend and by some idiosyncratic component. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, so that is what we allow for. I think that's quite flexible specification, but does impose certainly some structure at a level of relative prices over time uh, at the individual product level. Hmm. Great. Okay, so I think, um, I think we have had a chance to answer all the questions that have been submitted. So let me at this point um, thank both our presenters, Klaus and Ina. These, these were great presentations. Obviously, I have a bit of a vested interest in one of the presentations, but nevertheless, um, really enjoyed both presentations. And I think, Rafael, if I'm not mistaken, this will be the last presentation for the spring. So um, I just wanted to say I think the series has been terrific. I've enjoyed it a great deal. And I didn't know if you had any closing remarks, perhaps, that you wanted to share with, with the um, audience. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently, I was incorrect. There appears to be one more on March 23rd. So why don't you go ahead and correct my error, Rafael, for, for us, if you could. Oh, there, sorry. There's, there's always more, right? The more is better. So, uh, <laughs> there's always there's errors there. on my part, too. Yes. No, no, no. But thank you so much. Um, thank you both for, for presenting and these excellent presentations. Um, and thank you very much, Rob, for, for moderating. And, and there's one more to return to. Thank you.